Buongiorno a tutti. Hi everybody. So, benvenuti, buonasera. Questa è la diretta con cui presenteremo la mostra virtuale eh, su mh, Caruso di Stefano Corelli, organizzata e realizzata dal Teatro alla Scala per il Ministero degli Esteri italiano. Um, in a few seconds, I will speak in English, but now I want to introduce it in Italian. È una uh, mostra uh, di cui siamo molto fieri e che sarà uno dei primi eventi uh, organizzati uh, da me, Marco Gioacchini, sono il nuovo direttore dell'Istituto Italiano di Cultura a Dublino, e insieme a tutti i colleghi dell'Istituto uh, di Cultura. E è un grande onore perché è una mostra molto bella, eh, gratuita, e quindi online e che raggruppa uh, tre grandi uh, tenori che hanno mh, che quest'anno uh, di cui celebriamo i cento anni dalla morte e dalla nascita. Uh, I switch in, in English, so uh, thank you very much, greetings everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this special occasion, an evening of celebration of three internationally known Italian tenors who are subjects of several initiatives promoted by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to mark the anniversary of Caruso's death, as well as the birth of Corelli and Di Stefano. 100 years ago, in 1921, Enrico Caruso, one of the most famous singers in history, passed away in Naples. In that same year, Two of the renowned tenors of the last century were born, Giuseppe Di Stefano and Franco Corelli, who at La Scala Theatre were protagonists of some legendary shows. So the Italian Institute of Culture in Dublin has decided to take part by organizing three different events in the next couple of days. So I'm glad to share a brief overview before we start with tonight's main event. So first of all, I'd like to uh, remind you of tomorrow's night's concert at Hugh Lane Gallery. It will be a selection of sublime areas from classical opera and Napolitan tradition songs, which will be performed by tenor Patrick Highland and pianist Merit Hurley, with the artistic uh, direction of Vivian Coates. On Thursday and Friday, will be possible to get exclusive access to the Museum Enrico Caruso, hosted in the former residence of the tenor in La Stracigna in Tuscany. So the Institute has organized two online guided tours, one in Italian and one in English, for a limited number of participants. So back to our main event today, It will be a journey of discovery of the virtual exhibition Caruso Corelli di Stefano, Italian Opera Singers, an exhibition fully available in English online. And so for that, I would like to formally introduce the curator of this incredible project, Mattia Palma, and extend my most sincere gratitude for being here with us today. Hello, Mattia. Thank you. Hello, Marco. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Grazie, grazie. Thank you for being here. And uh, Mattia is a journalist and a music critic from Milan. He is editorial consultant of Museo Teatrale alla Scala, which is the museum inside the Teatro alla Scala, and editorial coordinator of La Scala magazine. He is the house organ of La Scala Theatre. Together with Mattia, we are today connected with Paolo Besana, head of Teatro alla Scala's press office in Milan and member of the exhibition's scientific committee. Ciao Paolo. Ciao, good evening everyone. Benvenuto. Thanks. And we have also Marco Ramelli, which is guitar lecturer and researcher at the Technological University Dublin Conservatoire and artistic director of the Teatro Centro Asteria in Milan. Hi, Marco. Ciao. We cannot hear you. Hello, everyone. Ciao. 
Thank you. So now I I beg um, Mar uh, Mattia to launch the first video introduction of the virtual exhibition, so you can understand what the exhibition goes. Uh, okay, okay, Marco. So now I will share my screen. And we will show, okay, can you, can you see the poster of the question? Okay, so uh, now, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, so let's watch the, this short introduction, uh, the video in order to explain the sense of this exhibition. Okay. 100 anni fa, il 2 agosto del 1921, Enrico Caruso si spegneva a soli 48 anni nella sua Napoli, all'apice della popolarità. Lo stesso anno, come in un ideale passaggio di testimone, nascevano altri due tenori che nel dopoguerra avrebbero trionfato in tutto il mondo, Franco Corelli e Giuseppe Di Stefano. Questo anniversario è l'occasione per ricordare tre artisti che si sono dati il cambio per rappresentare la cultura italiana nel mondo e che hanno traghettato il mito del tenore nella modernità. Il tenorismo all'italiana era nato nella prima metà dell'Ottocento con Giovanni Battista Rubini, il tenore romantico per eccellenza. Invece alla fine del secolo uno dei tenori più noti era senza dubbio Francesco Tamagno, che Giuseppe Verdi scelse come primo otello per i suoi acuti squillanti e il fraseggio possente. Enrico Caruso, giunto alla ribalta alla svolta del secolo, era riuscito a riunire in una sola personalità artistica sia la dolcezza vellutata di Rubini sia l'atletismo vocale di Tamagno. La sua lezione, documentata per la prima volta nella storia anche dai dischi, quindi dalla riproducibilità tecnica della sua voce, come la chiamerebbe Walter Benjamin, venne assorbita dai tenori delle generazioni successive. Prima Beniamino Gigli, poi, a partire dagli anni 50, spiccano Franco Corelli e Giuseppe Di Stefano. Proseguendo lungo questa strada, si arriva naturalmente anche a Luciano Pavarotti. Caruso, Corelli e Di Stefano, durante la loro carriera, hanno portato avanti, più o meno consapevolmente, una vera e propria missione diffondere nel mondo l'opera italiana, quindi la lingua e la cultura del nostro paese, viaggiando da una parte all'altra di ogni oceano per cantare in tutti i continenti. Del resto, il melodramma è una delle grandi invenzioni della nostra storia letteraria di rilievo internazionale. Fin dai poeti e librettisti che nel Settecento dominavano la scena musicale europea, da Metastasio a Lorenzo da Ponte, per arrivare ai compositori della tradizione ottocentesca e della giovane scuola. La Scala è sempre stata uno dei principali centri diffusori dell'opera italiana, uno dei primi teatri in cui si è valorizzato l'aspetto culturale di una serata all'opera, e non solo quello sociale o mondano. Si deve a due personaggi la trasformazione della Scala in uno dei templi dell'opera più importanti al mondo, il direttore d'orchestra Arturo Toscanini e l'impresario Giulio Gatti Casazza, i quali si ritroveranno poi a New York, dove insieme a Caruso daranno vita a una stagione musicale leggendaria. Very impressive, very interesting introduction. Thank you very much, Mattia. And uh, um, before giving you the floor for uh, explaining us the sections of the exhibition, I would like to uh, point out two questions that probably you could summarize at the end of your presentation. The first is, um, was it challenging Uh, to retrieve information about the lives of uh, those artists. And how did you approach this task? For example, how did you figure out to uh, present this material to a younger and modern audience? This is the first question. The second is, how do you think changed in time the career of a tenor? I mean, uh, uh, would still be possible for people nowadays Uh, for somebody, somebody with such a uh, talent to achieve the glory of uh, those uh, of those days in the last century. So, please 
explain us uh, what is this exhibition is like and uh, I give you the floor. Thank you, Marco. But I hope I will be able to answer to, to your questions during the, the, the guided tour of uh, the exhibition. Uh, so I'm going to, to share my screen again. Okay, so we continue the visit and we uh, move uh, to the foyer, uh, to the, 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 the hall behind the boxes of uh, Teatro alla Scala. This is the, 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 the real Ridotto dei Palchi Arturo Toscanini, but with uh, a, a, a digital, a virtual architecture that you can see. Uh, so the, it doesn't exist, <laughs> obviously, but the, the, the space is the, the real Ridotto dei Parchi. Um, I, I, the, the first thing I want to show you is the, the timeline uh, on the, uh, here on the right, uh, where uh, we can find uh, all the operas sung by, by the three tenors uh, at La Scala. Uh, only five for Caruso, uh, because most of his career took place uh, in the United States, uh, actually. Uh, then we have at least 20 operas for Franco Corelli, and finally 34 for Giuseppe Di Stefano. Um, and I think this is a, a first uh, uh, information. Uh, people might, um, uh, may, may have. Uh, I think that the first challenge of this project was uh, to understand which was uh, uh, the perspective uh, to give to this exhibition. Um, because on one, one side, we had to offer the contents uh, in, in the most precise and uh, we can say scientific way. Uh, but on, on the other side, we, we didn't want to be too specialized uh, because we are sure that the target uh, of a digital of, of a digital exhibition uh, isn't made only of uh, experts uh, who know everything about the career of Caruso, Corelli, and Di Stefano, uh, but maybe even just curious people who are possibly familiar with them, uh, but without knowing everything about them. Uh, so actually we wanted to be able to interest, uh, to interest both groups. Uh, and so for, to, to, to answer the, the, the first uh, uh, of, uh, of your question, I think that uh, it's, uh, our aim, aim was uh, to make people understand not only the artistic path or the vocal characterization of the three tenors, but even to suggest some ideas on what uh, might be their personality. Uh, and here we have three more details videos here in, in the posters um, and where we can uh, know more about their life. And uh, of course, uh, the-, the I can, I, As I can see, there are lots of videos and wow, yes, files of yes, yes. okay. very is, multimedia exhibition. Yes, that was uh, uh, our our purpose. And uh, the, the, the life of, Enrico Caruso was really full of interesting events. So uh, we, we had to, 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 to make a choice to, to focus on few key themes um, that are basically his humble child, childhood and youth uh, in Naples um, and his uh, nostalgic relationship uh, with his city uh, for, for uh, during all his life. And finally, I, I think his curiosity towards the technology. Uh, in fact, at the center, at the center of this uh, of this room, of the space dedicated to Caruso, uh, we we can find a, a gramophone uh, and a camera. A gramophone because Caruso was the, the first important opera singer who made a recording. It was uh, in uh, in 1902 in a hotel here in Milan, uh, close to La Scala. And in a few years, he, he became uh, the first recording star of Italian music. And 
of classical music. It was the first tenor to, to, to do that. Um, but Caruso also, there's a camera because Caruso also decided to, to act in, uh, in two movies. Uh, today, only one of them remains. The title is uh, My Cousin. Uh, it isn't a, a masterpiece, but uh, it's a very interesting film for, uh, for Caruso's fan because we can get an idea of how uh, he was on the stage. Uh, we, we can see it, but uh, I maybe I prefer to get this. Uh, Okay, I stop because uh, uh, there will be a surprise uh, in, uh, at the end of the tour. Um, to, to the walls uh, of the room, um, there, are, uh, there are some photos, some, some, some stage photos, uh, and each one represents a significant opera of Caruso's career. Um, a significant role he played. Uh, I think that the main difficulty here was uh, to choose uh, operas that were actually significant uh, for, Caruso, for, for Caruso's career, but at the same time, operas uh, of which we have uh, um, photos and uh, recordings. And unfortunately, this is not always the case. Uh, for, ex for, for example, uh, we, we don't have uh, any recordings of uh, Puccini's uh, La, La Fanciulla del West uh, that, that Caruso performed at the premiere in New York with uh, Arturo Toscanini. Uh, but we, we can find many other operas uh, by Verdi, by, by Puccini, by Donizetti, uh, or French works like uh, Le Pechot de Perle, Carmen. Uh, and all these operas represent, uh, I think, the versatility, the, the versatility of Caruso's voice. Uh, he was a tenor uh, who didn't have a precise label uh, he could he could be both dramatic and lyric. Uh, for instance, if uh, we click uh, on Aida, we can even stop it, and then there's a short text, uh, and we have uh, uh, some photos and another little surprise, uh, some drawings, because uh, Caruso, maybe you don't know that Caruso had a great talent for drawing and his caricatures are really, really interesting and, and funny. Um, so this was, uh, this is the space dedicated to, to him. Now we can move on and go to, to, to another room, uh, that of Di Stefano, for example. Uh, there's a video at the entrance um, about Di Stefano personality, about his life and his career. Uh, and we have other two objects. Uh, there's, a, there's a television and there's a record player um, from the 60s or so, another, uh, another, another era, another age. Uh, and uh, here there's a, a playlist uh, uh, by a Warner playlist, uh, Spotify, Apple Music. Uh, uh, to, to, to listen, it's a, an extra audio content. And uh, here there's a, a video of Di Stefano singing Kegeli da Manina from La Bohème with Carla Fracci uh, listening to him uh, as a, a silent uh, Mimi. Kegeli da Manina se la la So uh, obviously Carla Fracci didn't sing, but it, it, it's uh, uh, a rare uh, film 
And uh, uh, to the walls, uh, there are many significant uh, roles and many signature roles of the Stefano. There's a uh, Umballo in Maschera, Elixir d'Amore, Rigoletto, even some more uh, unusual opera like uh, Iris uh, by, by Pietro Mascagni. Um, and uh, here, there's Di Stefano with Maria Callas. Actually, both Di Stefano and Corelli had a fundamental uh, encounter with uh, Maria Callas. They were the protagonists of the opera scene in the, in the 50s uh, at La Scala. Uh, and we, we I think that here we try to, to send uh, uh, a particular message uh, that Di Stefano was uh, a lyric tenor and uh, with one of the most beautiful voice uh, of, uh, of, the, of the 20th century. And I think one could say that, he, uh, that, that his uh, was uh, uh, the voice of Italian economic boom, uh, which was growing and leaving uh, all uh, the worries about, uh, about, the, about the past, about the Second World War. So this is... Uh, uh, I think the, the meaning of uh, the choices we made uh, of these, uh, of these uh, operas. And the third room, the one of Corelli, Franco Corelli. Um, uh, Franco Corelli was uh, the, the exact opposite, uh, we, we can say, uh, at least uh, in our interpretation. He, he had uh, a darker nuance uh, in his voice uh, uh, compared to Di Stefano, uh, even because uh, throughout his career he felt, he felt a little uh, he always felt a little afraid before entering the stage, uh, despite uh, his talent and his beauty even. Uh, uh, but he was able to turn a defect into a value. One could say that it, that, that it, it was uh, insecurity that made Corelli's interpretation so special and dramatic and perfect for characters like uh, in uh, romantic operas uh, by Verdi or by, uh, by, by Bellini uh, or in the Verismo repertoire, for instance, Turido in, the Cavalleria, in Cavalleria Rusticana. And here in the television, uh, we can find a very beautiful video of Cavalleria Rusticana rehearsals uh, with uh, Giulietta Simonato at La Scala. Yes, okay, now there, there, there was uh, mostly uh, Giulietta Simeonato, but <laughs> even Franco Corelli sang. Um, I think that uh, this Corelli's portrait uh, can disprove the cliche of the singer considered as uh, a robot, uh, always able to control uh, their emotions when, when they go on stage. And uh, maybe this could be a good lesson even for, for 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 a tenor of today, so this uh, to, to 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 give you an answer to your second question, and uh, the the last section finally is uh, um, deals with a Neapolitan song. Uh, that is a fundamental tradition for Caruso because uh, it reminded him of his childhood when he used to live uh, with the specter of poverty. Uh, Caruso, uh, Caruso was a migrant, after all, a rich migrant, because uh, he moved to the United States, to the United States uh, when he was already a star. But uh, during all his life, he felt strongly connected to his city. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps it is no coincidence that when, when he died, he was in Naples. And after Caruso's recording, all the great tenors have measured themselves with these songs, with the, these Neapolitan songs, including Corelli and Di Stefano. And here you can find uh, a playlist uh, of some of the most popular Neapolitan songs. 
So, and that's all. Thank you, Mattia. As I can see, uh, you can um, you can see the sections of the exhibitions yes. as well from the rooms as well from the main menu that you have mm -hmm. the main bar that you have upstairs. Okay, so there are several uh, contents are that can be seen. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting and very well done and very full of interesting videos and audios and uh, curiosities. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mattia, for having done this, uh, this kind of exhibitions. And uh, thank you very much to Paolo also, because Teatro La Scala is uh, the main uh, um, organizer of this exhibition. And uh, from, of course, uh, uh, Museo, Museo Teatro La Scala. I would ask uh, uh, Paolo, uh, which was the main objective of this project? And also, um, Two questions. How do you mm, evaluate opera and lyric uh, worldwide trends now from the Teatro La Scala uh, point of view, for example? Uh, and the second is mm, if you have some other projects about uh, those three panels or some other projects uh, with Teatro La Scala that you could share with us today. Well, uh, about the, the about the international situation, you know, uh, I'm just back for a sh from a short travel I did with uh, my uh, intendant, my, my general manager, Dominique Meyer. We we went in a few European cities uh, to present uh, next season and the future projects of La Scala, and. Uh, I must say, this was really uh, an interesting chance to meet people. Uh, I mean, not only journalists, but also people from the music world and uh, donors sometimes, and, uh, and to share uh, opinions. And I, I must say, I, I feel trust. Uh, I feel a lot of trust. Y you know, now we have in a quite different situation from uh, other countries because almost everywhere in Europe, uh, uh, since they have a green pass, uh, there is also permission uh, to have a full audience. And uh, it was very impressive for me to go to the Vienna State Opera before uh, summer uh, to attend uh, um, a performance of Macbeth. And uh, after such a long time to, to see myself uh, in a crowded audience. Uh, and uh, so it, it was quite strange, but uh, this is what happens in theaters everywhere in Europe. And uh, as far as we know, uh, it should happen quite uh, shortly uh, also in Italy. Uh, we, we wait to have uh, at least 80% uh, in October and we, wait, and we hope for more uh, later uh, during the fall. So uh, my hope is to be able to open the season on December 7 with a full audience. Um, so uh, we, we all know that the path is still long. Uh, we all know that just opening theatres doesn't mean that uh, people will come back immediately uh, for many reasons, because um, partly because they lost the habit, uh, partly because uh, of financial reasons. Uh, and uh, so it will, it will be a long path. But uh, at the same time, it's, uh, it's important to, uh, to start moving. Uh, the earlier we begin, we, early, we, we will uh, achieve uh, the result we want. And I, I must say that uh, at the moment, maybe the, the, bigger, um, the bigger issue is about traveling. Because we, we can open our theaters and we know that our audience will slowly, not, not all... All, all, all at 
at one time, but they, they, they will slowly come back. What uh, we are not sure about is, uh, will foreigners come, come back to, and uh, how much uh, it will take? And, uh, and there is also a big problem about, um, about tours. Uh, we, we, we are an international business. Most of the people in this business is used to, to travel a lot. And uh, traveling is still the, the most fragile part. Uh, we know, for instance, there are, um, well, in, in this small tour of, of Europe, we were in, in Vienna, uh, in, um, in Zurich and Lausanne, and then in Paris and London. Uh, you know, for instance, the Wiener Philharmonic travel worldwide, and, and and they are and they are traveling, and it's uh, it's funny enough that they they are they are nowadays traveling a lot with Herbert Blomstedt, uh, this very old patriarch. It's a sort of a musical and human miracle, and uh, but for instance, there are uh, British orchestras who are really in a mess now because uh, due partly to the pandemic and partly to Brexit, uh, they will have to reduce uh, the, the, the amount of foreign concert, concerts uh, uh, consistently. And, and, we, and we will see what, what's going on. The scala itself, has great projects uh, for uh, for the next year, including China and Japan. Um, such big uh, foreign pro foreign projects are uh, maybe the, the the most jeopardized part jeopardized part of uh, of our activity. But still, we are very confident. We are confident. We see that, for instance, you know, we are now in Lombardy. Uh, we ha we have more of eighty percent of the population who is vaccinated, and therefore we we can uh, we we can be quite confident, and we have good signs because, for instance, the the our campaign for season tickets is more or less. Uh, the same uh, has more or less the same results we have in, in 2019, which is which is really good. And uh, and on top of this, I think that we are lucky because in in the years to come, Milan has uh, uh, the perspective of the Olympics. So uh, we we can be quite confident that people will come back in in the years to come. And uh, as for the, the second question, question um, well, the first project we have uh, about this, about Caruso is, uh, as um, a whole day of studies we are organizing for the late month of October uh, with, uh, um, you know, that there's a national committee who is, uh, who, who, who is, uh, organizing a lot of initiatives all around Italy and we want to be part of it of course and so this is the the, the first thing and uh, well for the rest we we have big projects the first is normality uh, just to to perform our season and uh, but we also have uh, some uh, long-term projects, including a new building. We are being, building a new tower in Via Verde, just close to La Scala, uh, to host uh, the new um, rehearsal room for the orchestra and uh, the whole of the offices, because now we have offices spread around in the city, and this is no, not very practical nor uh, nor uh, very economical, and uh, and and the other big projects uh, for the for uh, for the years to come is uh, a, a sort of city of music and theater in um, 
well, it's not in central Milan, but we want to, uh, to concentrate to have uh, all our laboratories uh, and uh, the academy and so on in one place. Uh, so we are now um, having uh, together with the Comunidad Milano an international competition for architects to build uh, this new city of music. And so this is more or less a, a, an overlook on what we are doing. Thank you very much, Paul. It was very interesting to, to hear you speaking about those projects. Of course, to be uh, to come back to normality is the first main project of all this yeah. uh, artistic field. And uh, um, of course, it is interesting also to understand how the main uh, players of the music, uh, international music players like La Scala, will uh, will manage with this uh, mixed media format, for example, showing on stage and streaming online, and how it can be made with uh, uh, with this in TV broadcasting or uh, internet and so on. But this is another question I would like to ask you um, probably in the future. Now I want to, to ask Marco, which is uh, an eclectic figure, huh? of the Italian and Irish music scene. Uh, Marco, you are, you are a performer, teacher, uh, artistic director, academic, composer, of course. And uh, um, you have told me that in Dublin also, uh, they are going to uh, refurbish some concert halls or uh, to build other uh, spaces, for example, like in Milan, they are, they are doing. Yes, yes. Well, the place where I'm now is quite new. It's the new, it's the new conservatory that is uh, the north side of uh, Dublin in Genji Grover. And we have uh, a new auditorium, uh, it's, uh, 500 seat and a lot of other uh, other spaces. Oh, sorry, <laughs> the light. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Marco, um, so you are a teacher. So I want to ask you, according to your teaching experience, what is the best way to bring to young people closer to music and opera, for example, and uh, do this kind of a virtual exhibition can, uh, can help in this task? Okay, yes, for sure. Yesterday, I actually, I had a virtual tour with my students, so they were very captured and, uh, by all the continents and listening and looking at all the videos. Uh, yes, so the first thing is that what I think that uh, um, is one of the main features of the opera or in general the music, but the opera maybe more, that can attract uh, young people is because it speaks about life, about emotion. And what I found very uh, inspiring and uh, about this exhibition is that what uh, you mentioned before, Mattia, that uh, you tried to show also the personality of uh, and the life of the of the of, of the singers and uh, and how the music was intertwined with their life. So how sound and emotion were interconnected. Uh, so I think that you know showing also the different uh, personality between uh, the Stefan and Corelli, it was quite. Uh, inspiring for the student and quite uh, you know a revelation um, but you know the second thing is that you know is very important to to get inspired by those great uh, uh, great personality that managed to really connect life and music but also who is very important to listen live music so I think that the the most uh, powerful instrument that we have to encourage a young student and to teach student is to go and listen live music and listen to the great singer listen to the great production uh, because it can be really a moment that can change the life and you know i think that you know every one of us that you know we love music and it was one moment when we listened something that was so special that we decided you know we want to spend a huge part of our life in music or connected with music It's very interesting because, of course, uh, uh, young people uh, need to, to, to find a path, need to find a, a way 
for their lives. So music can be one of those, of course. And uh, if you, I mean, if you teach in a conservatoire, you know it very bad, better than than us. Okay, do you want to to ask something to Matteo, to Paolo? Yes, I have two questions. One is if there is a curiosity or an aspect that you didn't know before preparing the the exhibition that you you discover why you are you were working on uh, on this project uh caruso was uh, the i think the, the most interesting uh, of uh, the three tenors and in in caruso's life there are many many um, strange things even uh for example he was uh, uh, protagonist of, uh, I think, the first uh, uh, Me Too scandal in the 20th century, and <laughs> and the, I, I discovered it uh, reading a biography by a, a music, an Italian music critic, Eugenio Gara, and and it, uh, I was shocked because uh, uh, the, the the articles and the, the uh, all the, the the opinions we we that they could read uh, were exactly the same as today. So it it, it, it wasn't it, it it was exactly the same the same stuff the same thing. And but there are many many aspects of uh, Caruso Caruso's life. Even uh, even Caruso was insecure, for example, and. Uh, the, the the verismo of Caruso was uh, his uh, humanity, and I think that mm, we that that in uh, in many of the recordings we you you you, you could uh, listen to in in, in the tour uh, you you can hear it. Yes. Uh, tomorrow, maybe. tomorrow, I think that uh, some of those curiosity can be shown also the day after tomorrow in the guided tour of the uh, Villa Museo of uh, Rico Caruso. Of course, uh, over there you have uh, uh, mostly uh, objects, uh, but also uh, letters and uh, stage uh, uh, materials that can be very interesting for our uh, music lovers. Okay, go ahead, Marco. Sorry. Oh, the, yes, um, um, is uh, you know that that things is passed very clearly from the exhibition. There's also connection with the life and how the music, you know, in the audio that that uh, is very clear to, uh, at least to me. And the second thing is that I want to ask is that it's very clear also from the exhibition that uh, they they want to reach a larger public, larger audience. So. They didn't want only to reach uh, opera lovers, and uh, I think that maybe this one can be also a question to to Paolo that you know uh, because uh, La Scala I know that is doing a lot of uh, things to reach a larger audience and uh, you know maybe to talk a little bit about that and uh, uh, if there are any projects uh, specific on that. You know. Um... Enlarging the audience is the task of every opera manager in the world. Uh, the first thing I like to underline is that uh, the audience of opera is not small. Uh, we are not, if you are a niche, if we are a niche, we are not a very small niche. Uh, La Scala has uh, <clears throat> 400,000 attendance per year in in a city with 1 million 1.6 million so um, maybe of course we sell tickets to all the same people so it's uh, uh, it's not that part of the city but still it's a huge number and uh, when we show our opening night on television we have more than 2.5 million people watching and uh, when even when i go to to other countries i mean it's 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 stunning how many people love opera everywhere in the world so the first thing is 
I really think we, we have to stop thinking about ourselves as a small little cluster of strange people loving a strange thing. No, we are, uh, we are a bunch of people, a lot of people really, uh, but still <laughs> we have to enlarge this. And uh, I must say that La Scala worked uh, in this direction since a long time, uh, namely uh, since Paolo Grassi uh, made a huge project to talk with the students, retired people and workers. And this project is still working and it accounts for a little less one, than one third of our sellings which is anyway, a lot. Um, the, the main problem of enlarging uh, audiences is the price, because we are sure that a lot of people would like to come. And the problem is economics. How can we lower our prices uh, with, without going in bankruptcy in, uh, in, in a couple of years? This is difficult. Um, we started making some steps in this direction. For instance, uh, well, we, La Scala was a theater selling uh, more or less half of his occupancy uh, in uh, a first price range. We changed that and now uh, one third of the parterre is sold uh, at a lower price, not much lower, but it's a first step. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, trying to have lower prices uh, make, makes it a necessity to have other um, sources of income. And uh, we are sure that, that technology can help we are making a new system of cameras everywhere in the, in the theater in order to be able to uh, share all uh, the, to stream um, every uh, single performance. And of course, we will have a mixed system, maybe something for free, something in a, in a sort of, well, woo something we, we can you can maybe just pay for a ticket for for that night or uh, we will we can uh, imagine season tickets uh, and so on uh, we are sure that in the future uh, it, it will help uh, you know also in this case you you you, you can you, you should not imagine that it's uh, just magic and once you make um, uh, pay for streaming, uh, pay for streaming, you get rich. No, but you, but you maybe convince other people to come, and uh, you can have a, a little more money. And uh, but you can also attract sponsors this way. So I think that the key is lower the price and work on technology. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Marco, for asking these questions and also for uh, making us uh, understand that also this kind of exhibition can help for, uh, for making music and opera closer to the people, for example because what we are doing tonight is to, to, to tell the people to go to see this exhibition because it's very interesting, because it's very full of important and interesting information. And because uh, through that, people can understand that probably go and see uh, an opera uh, is very uh, interesting and can bring us um, many interesting emotions and uh, new emotion also. Um, of course, I think that the most uh, important is to go and see 
the opera on stage because on stage you can see the orchestra, you can feel the vibrations of the music, but of course also streaming online can help. So uh, with this purpose, I ask uh, Mattia to launch the, the, the last video. And uh, with that, uh, we uh, finish this, uh, this presentation. It is an impossible concert, isn't it, Mattia? It's very interesting. Yes, it is. It's a sort of medley uh, okay. with Vestila Juba sung by the three tenors. Okay, so this is something that we can only find online because we cannot see it anymore on stage. Okay, let's go. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, this way we can also hear the different styles of uh, the three tenors that sound the same aria, but in different styles. It's very, very interesting, very uh, overwhelming. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you uh, to all of you, uh, to Mattia, Paolo, Marco, and uh, uh, for staying here, for uh, inviting us to visit this uh, wonderful exhibition. Thank you to Teatro La Scala, of course, for having organized these, uh, uh, these exhibitions and for uh, accepting our invitation tonight. And thank you to Marco for being uh, here with us uh, from the Conservatoire of Dublin. So um, thank you very much. And see you for next projects. And in Dublin, of course, we wait for some collaboration with Teatro La Scala. Okay. Thank you, Marco. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>